let me introduce you properly before I hand over to you. Um, uh, so you are currently HNS project manager for the critical control management program for Bottom Fall Group from Solna. How did I pronounce it? Well done. Well done, okay. In Sweden, um, you have an experience as the OHS program manager in Ericsson. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working on a, well, the EHS, all these abbreviations, uh, implementation support in Sandvik. You have experience as auditor, safety compliance consultant, senior technical vessel manager with Mega Yacht. <laughs> you have been a small business owner and a yacht captain for multiple years. So he has some nice stories to tell. So uh, if we go out, we have some time later today uh, uh, for dinner. Uh, there will be, I, I'm sure there will be some great stories. You like to steer your own boat in the beautiful waters of Sweden and you also like to take a risk every now and then on your motorbike. Uh, <laughs> Jasper is already standing up. Uh, Jasper, uh, your signature says barrier management psychologist. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, but I think you are also sort of a, sort of a technical geek on the other end as, as well. So sometimes you downplay yourself a bit on that, I, I would say. But okay. it's good. It's good. <laughs> Uh, experience in various fields and regions, including mining, wind, new energy, transport, from Asia to Canada, and um, Doing it all. you're assisting Taylor, uh, oh, the, the, the CCM team of group, to help steer and run in-depth workshops and, and uh, company-wide risks. So your focus in Brazilian is academy and development of serious games. So uh, that's also part of it. Uh, we've been talking about how do we engage workforce. We can do it in procedures, but why not play, right? Uh, and in his spare time, he likes to do fencing. And do you still do some stand-up? Well, it's more uh, improvisational. Improvisation, yeah, yeah. Right. So, uh, unfortunately, you still do it, yeah. So shall I ask you some funny questions? Yeah, no, 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 please don't. No, I got it covered. Yeah, I, got, yeah, yeah. I got the covered. OK, good. Enjoy. Thanks. So um, we have a really, really nice professional brand toolbox, which is one of the benefits of working for a company uh, that sort of has all aspects covered. And they've done a really, really nice job of putting up some fantastic photos. Um, and usually they have kids or beach scenes. But what is really nice are these photos remind me of why we're here. Why is it just working for renewable companies? Um, is that we don't want, you know, as I think I saw, I saw a sci-fi movie recently and said, we are planet eaters. And I was like, that makes sense. So our goal is to make it so we don't eat this one entirely and we leave something for these kids in the next generation. So it's important to remember why we're here. And, uh, and with that, we'll jump in. Um, so the, again, the main reason that we're here is to talk about how to make the, the industry and, um, and to work together to make our industries safer. So um, with that, I probably need a bit of technical support up here. All right, so um, yeah, we are the first of the, this is the second uh, Making Risk Manageable event. However, it is the first one where we've actually done it and we've included other uh, renewable corporations and uh, we are the first ones to be able to host it. So we're really fortunate to have been invited for that. So, um, so thank you very much for including us in this partnership. So this is a little bit about Vattenfall. So we are one of the largest producers and retailers of electricity. And um, as you may have already guessed, based on the fact that this is a renewables event, is that we actually are one of the larger producers of renewable electricity. There's a lot of numbers on this, um, but what's really interesting is uh, there's two numbers that stand out for me here. Uh, the first and the last. So we are 100% owned by the Swedish state. So when we make an investment, I know there's a lot of push right now in Sweden to invest in nuclear. So when we make an investment, we are investing taxpayer dollars. So we have a lot of scrutiny. And our board of directors are the members of parliament, at least one of them, Eva Bush in particular, um, energy minister. So the last one is also really important. And um, we've grown since then. These are the numbers at the end of 2022. Um, 
So I think we're up to about 20,000 employees now, if not a little bit more. But what's really interesting for me is on that last number is that there's 20,000 reasons to get this right. It's important. We operate in 10 countries, primarily Sweden, Germany, Netherlands, Denmark, and the UK. And as based on the name of the company, if you had to guess which one was where we started, you could probably figure out it was in hydro. So um, I, I was at a hydro facility and I had one of the guys say, what is all this, what is all this talk about wind? And I said, well, you know, it's, it's, it's really, we're, we're, we're going there. And he said, do you know how heavy water is? compared to wind and how much heavier of a turbine we can push with a liter of water? Because how much wind does that take? I said, I don't know, but I get your point. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so as you can see in the green dots here, we have a lot of production in terms of hydro facilities and we are in, uh, in a lot of other areas as well. It's a bit of a, um, it was explained to me one time when I first joined the company, it said a Vattenfall is like a, it's like a village. It's got one Vattenfall hat over a lot of different villages doing business. So it also t comes to one of the challenges that we have in rolling out a, a company-wide program where we are looking to, um, it's not a one size fit all. And as Jasper and I will talk about this later in the program, um, we have to make sure that there's an element in here where everyone has the opportunity to customize what we do on a group level so that it fits their individual needs. So we'll talk about that. And with that, this is our world. Our world needs change. And it needs it fast. Society is still dependent on fossil fuels, endangering businesses, environment, biodiversity, local communities, economic independence, and energy security. At Vattenfall, it's our business opportunity to change this. We're stepping up and showing the way elevating our efforts to continually redefine what an energy company and its partners can do. Creating a future where people and businesses can move, make and live fossil free. We call this fossil freedom. To deliver it, we're strengthening our relationships, working with innovative partners to push the boundaries of energy production using fossil free energy and technology making fossil-free power and heat accessible, cutting carbon from manufacturing and transport, leading by action, inspiring others and working together to enable fossil freedom for all. Uh, so this is Vattenfall. There's a check mark because we, we covered that. <laughs> We don't have to uh, bother you with that again. So we'll do, uh, we'll cover sort of the nuts and bolts. So um, can I get a show of hands? Who was at the Resilium event that we did February in, this year. in February this year in The Hague? How many people do we have? All right, so we're looking at, I don't know, 20% of the people that we had there. So good. So the, what we're doing is, um, for those of you who weren't there, which is, again, looking at 80%, we're going to do a bit of a rehash, um, sort of some of the material you'll, see, you'll have seen or it will be familiar to you. And the reason for that is so that when we talk about where we are now, you'll understand where we were. We are two years into this now. At the end of this year, we'll be two years into this, uh, the pilot phase, which we did in wind, and now into the rollout. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And then, uh, so yeah, we'll basically talk, yeah, basically what Taylor said, we were talk a, bit, a little bit about where we are now, what kind of challenges we're facing, what kind of routes we took, and uh, hopefully also how we overcome those challenges. And uh, by now, we've seen the first results trickle in as well. So we've been, uh, yeah, trying to measure, for example, the critical controls. We first have our first measures basically coming in. And um, uh, yeah, some interesting findings to share with that too, with you. So why do we pick critical control management um, and what is it? So um, critical control management is a proven methodology to eliminate avoidable fatalities. Avoidable because if someone decides when they show up at work that day, they don't want to go home safely, we can't stop that. But for the, for the controls that we, uh, for, for people going and doing the job to deliver the product to the customer, in this case electricity, um, we know what those controls are for the most part. 80%, I would say, if not higher, we know what they are. 
So this graph is really interesting. This is a sample data set. Um, there's a lot of companies out there with similar data sets. And the blue line represents people getting injured at work. And over time, we are injuring less and less people at work. Companies all across the board, all across the globe are doing that. The magenta line is the number of fatalities that are happening. And they are not decreasing at the same rate. So why is that? Any guess, Jasper? Well, I would say that there might be other aspects involved there. So there might be two different mechanisms at play. Uh, so just reducing your LTIs is not necessarily means that you're uh, reducing the same amount of fatalities. So there might be other types of controls, other mechanisms at play. So we need to be able to look at both. Simply solving your LTIs does not automatically mean that we're not uh, killing people as well. And uh, uh, another comment to add there is that for the fatalities, if you do a look at the investigations, what we find is that the controls that would have stopped it were known. And that's a bit of a scary part. That's, I mean, that, should, that's, that really yeah, yeah, makes, yeah. That makes people wake up. They go, wait a minute. They knew that they should have done that, and they didn't do it, and then they died. And they go, yeah. They go, why did they not do that thing? So that's really what we're doing is we're getting people to do what they know they should do before they do the job. So the, the scope and the CCM process. So it aims to answer, the CCM process aims to answer three primary questions. And that, of course, is the basis of the business model that we have, or the basis of the, the program. So Jasper, I'm going to ask you some questions that I'm hoping you know the answer to. So um, what is the first step in, in, in doing? How do we identify the actual hazards? What do we do here? Yeah, so I think the first question we ask ourselves is like, what are the major uh, risks that we are involved to keep, uh, that, that we do as, uh, as Vattenfall to make electricity? Um, and basically what we did is uh, ID the, and formalize those top risks. So we asked the different business areas to chip in and say, okay, what do you feel are the most concerning risks in your business area uh, uh, altogether? We pulled that together and basically uh, tried to find what are the most common ones and what are the ones that, are, that can potentially lead to a fatality. It's very similar actually to the type of exercise we did uh, uh, this morning where we just write these different hazards on the board. Every board has similar hazards on it. We basically pulled them together and, and weighed them in a sense to prioritize which of the risks we wanted to do first. Just as a way to get started with something because there's probably uh, millions of risks out, out there. We have to start somewhere and we did that by prioritizing. So we'll talk, on the next slide we'll talk a bit about more of the details in between. But the next big question that we ask ourselves is what are the critical controls for those activities that we do? Yeah, so uh, in order to answer that question, we basically uh, chose to create BOTAS for that as well. So we uh, identify the scenarios, the controls for it. And while well, there might be 40 controls on the bow tie or so, uh, for each of the bow ties, we uh, chose to select maybe one to three controls that were considered the critical controls, so like the really vital control elements uh, for that particular operation. And we were able to, to deduct it to that mm -hmm. usually that le level of three uh, controls, uh, roughly. The last question that the program aims to answer is, how well do these controls work? Yeah, and uh, we did that basically by going out and, and verifying, uh, verifying or evaluating how these controls have worked. So we uh, went out in the field and uh, asked basically uh, questions. How has this control been working in the last period, for example? So we asked uh, evaluation responses. So uh, uh, different people that actually worked with these controls had the opportunity to evaluate how these uh, things were performing. It was done in very simple uh, questionnaires to try to avoid uh, endless uh, checklists again. So it's more like an evaluation of the control uh, to get some feedback on that. And we got very interesting uh, results from that as well. So uh, just about the performance of those controls. So uh, again, we go from the blue over to the yellow. So this is the part when it transfers from sort of the project team. And that involves, that includes anyone who's involved in the process, whether it's sitting at group level or sitting at the BU, BA, or technicians in a lot of cases. So when we, we hand it over to the business, what are some really important aspects to consider there? Yeah, so I think at this stage uh, of the pro project, we roughly have filled in basically these blue dots. So we, we know how to do that and how to set it up as a process. <laughs> so we're actually already getting information about the performance of those controls. And you could say, well, that's the, the project finished, so we've visualized basically the performance of those controls, but that's of course not true. It only works if that data is also being used to close off important actions and make actual changes to the, on, on the work floor that make those controls better and that make it more likely uh, for it to work. So at some point, we have to hand up the information that we're gathering 
in such a way that it's digestible to the operation so that they can use it in, to the best of their ability to make the decisions and close out those kind of actions. So even though we as the CCM project, of course, don't go out and, ch and, and, and uh, make those actions closed, uh, that's the operations part. They know the best uh, how to do that. We need to make sure and understand how they come to their decisions so that we can deliver the information in the best way possible so that it aids their decision making as well. So uh, even though we don't close out the actions ourselves, we do need to be, uh, understand how they do that and, and, uh, so that we can well, tailor it to that, uh, that process so that we can visualize it in the best way. So in a bit more detail, as I mentioned before, this is actually a, a photo of the spreadsheet. We went out to the different business areas. So but for example, the top color is the business area and then the sub are the business units. And we asked them to prioritize their top risks. Then we did a weighted average. Someone did the weighted average. And then we figured out what the top risks were to make them all uh, sort of homogenized across the organization. So we knew as a group level where we should start focusing on, on the bow ties, which ones we should tackle first. And step number two is actually creating those bow ties. So what's happening in step three, Jasper? Yeah, so once we knew what the critical controls were from the bow ties, you usually are left with just a couple of words in a barrier box. So like uh, wearing the, the full arrest harness, for example. Well, that's a little bit too simple to just say it, it ends there. Like you said, for example, there's a lot of steps. If, if for example, you've used the harness, there are uh, steps involved with checking that it's not being used again. Uh, before we even uh, get to put it on, there's a procurement aspect to it. We need to make sure that the harnesses are uh, fit, uh, fit the body type, for example. People know how to use it, et cetera, et cetera. So what we do in these kind of workshops is like a deep dive in this particular critical control where we get experts from different business areas so that all have to work with these kinds of controls and uh, look at the technical aspects, so the hardware related to, uh, to make this control happen. Uh, the operational uh, aspect, uh, uh, oh, sorry, the organizational aspects, which is basically the competencies and the roles involved to make this control successful. And then lastly, the operational aspects, which is basically on the day of execution, what are the steps that need to be taken for this control to be effective. And we found, uh, basically looked at the different prerequisites to make those uh, uh, aspects there to really fully understand what do we actually mean by this full rest harness. There's a lot more activities going on than just putting it on. There's the procurement, the maintenance, all these kinds of things uh, that need to be considered to make that successful. Yeah, and Jasper mentioned earlier, <clears throat> one of the things we want to do is when we go out into the organization, we want to capture information in the easiest way possible so we have the, less, the least amount of impact on the business. I mean, we have to recognize that, at least as, as many people quite often tell me, they go, you're just costing us money, Taylor. The people in the field are making money. So minimize their amount of time. And that's a, that's, that is a true lesson we should all take away from this. If we can do this process and minimize the effort required by those who are actually making money and holding tools, that's how we can, we can also get uh, buy-in from the business so we can have the least impact as possible. The way that we're doing it right now is? Yeah, so we, we use very simple tools like, uh, uh, like Microsoft Forms that everybody understands. Uh, it should be something that you can complete in five minutes. And we usually do these, these evaluations once every quarter. So it's not like we're trying to force this on people every day or every, every month. It's once every quarter, uh, a, sh a short checklist that, uh, that you can complete in maybe two, uh, two minutes or so. There's, there's, I say there's some comments about that, um, about people grabbing information and when you should grab it. For example, if you're going to earth and you're working on a high voltage line, you should probably make sure that you've got the earthing on both sides of the line before you start work. Every single time. Every single time. But do you need to verify that there's still a railing on a wind turbine? Every single time? Every single time? Perhaps not. So there's a sensibility not. of how often you want to check certain controls. Some of them you might want to check daily. Some of them you might to check more over time. So currently we're doing more like an evaluation of the control. So we're asking people how has this control functioned the last uh, quarter, which is a bit subjective. Uh, we are also looking at all other more objective types of data sources where we're actually using data uh, that is being gathered in the organization, like uh, maintenance schedules and stuff like that, that we can uh, support it as evidence in a, in a sense. Uh, but first of all, the low-hanging fruit is just getting these evaluations in. We've get, we're getting tons of valuable feedback just for, by people saying that they had issues with this. Nothing happened with it. Like there's, It's not like a, a big incident happened, but they know that there might be an issue with this particular control, and that's already valuable for us to know. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> Ruben. Yeah, we just have a look over their shoulder at Ruben. Ruben, can you stand up for a yeah, second? Already at the yeah, bar. Yeah, I do. I do. Curtsy for us, thank you. 
if anyone in their organization has a Rubin, then you too can have a Power BI dashboard that displays your data. So we're really happy to have him on board to sort that for us. So we end up taking the data that comes in from these evaluations. And then if I get out of the way, you can see there's the green part, which is good. And then there's the red part, which isn't necessarily great. What this does is it points out, as Jasper said, areas that need attention. And what's really interesting about this, even though this data pool is happening three every quarter, this is still showing, and this is, this is actually a screenshot of the dashboard. This is actually showing information that is nowhere else coming to light in the organization. So it's doing the job. The business says, this is critical. And then the program says, there's a problem with that. And then there's the transition where we go from the blue to the yellow when we say to the business, let's work together to figure out how to actually put this in the systems and make sure we can actually solve this. So we can eventually end up with yeah. less, less red. And then what happens in the final step? Yeah. Uh, it's of course like uh, if we see some red, we want to try to fix it. I mean, we can also take, of course, credit for the fact that a lot of it is green uh, most of the times. Uh, but then uh, we'll do a little plan do check act type of cycle around those controls to make sure that we improve them as well. So that's the action uh, tracking and closure. Yeah. So very quickly, how? I mean, I'm <laughs> cognizant of the time, so we uh, we may have to speed up slightly. Um, so how do did we like? What's the strategy that we roughly chose? Uh, there's a couple of things. Um, we wanted to make uh, this, this uh, CCM uh, project work for the entirety of Vattenfall. So there's many different business areas doing different things. So you have like uh, hydroelectric, but then also wind, and then you have heat, uh, different uh, power sources. Each of them have unique forms, different shapes, different sizes. And it's sort of, we want to apply it to all of these kind of things with all the sites. Uh, so in order to do that, we roughly divided uh, uh, or identified three layers of, in the organization. So in blue, you have the, the group level, which is the business area overarching type of uh, 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 organization structure. Then in the yellow, you have the business area slash business unit area. Uh, so the different uh, uh, regions, basically, or sites, or uh, it could be uh, more like a, uh, an area of, uh, of generation. And then at green, you have the actual site level, so the operation where the, the, the rubber meets the road, basically. So what we did, uh, so Taylor and I would be sitting on the, at the group level, uh, where we uh, roughly cut out the rough idea of how a rollout uh, should look like. And part of that would be to identify what the top risks are shared among the different business areas. And then uh, we also facilitated the construction of what we call the core bow tie. So these are generic risk assessments that should be roughly applicable to different sites within Vattenfall. Very similar to the types of bow ties that, well, perhaps the Renewables Club might be able to produce uh, at some point. So it's a generic type of risk assessment. We know that if it's generic, it's not specific enough. So it's not gonna, gonna work for every single business area. So that's why uh, at the BA uh, level, uh, they run their own little project within the CCM, so they can have a little bit of freedom of how they want to roll it out. But they can take a copy, for example, of that core bow tie, so let's say working at height, copy it and uh, translate it into their local reality. So they make adjustments, so for example, certain scenarios might not be relevant, certain controls might not be relevant, maybe they have a different term for the same type of control. So we adjust it accordingly. Every time we do that, we have an opportunity to also reflect on the core bow tie. If we see that almost all the sites are changing one barrier to something else, then it's probably an indication that the core bow tie was not as good as we would like, so we can improve it. So out of that flows uh, like a more localized uh, bow ties that still are very similar to the core bow tie. So uh, we're not completely reinventing the wheel every time. Uh, it saves a lot of time by starting with the core bow tie because most of it's already there. You just have to check if it's, uh, if it's indeed correct. And then last, uh, uh, we have, of course, at the site level, a review cycle around the critical control. So we have a small set of critical controls per bow tie. These need to be checked at the different sites. Uh, but like we said, this is done on a quarterly basis with a very small questionnaire to minimize the impact that we have on the operation. Set. So we try to do most of the, the, the heavy lifting needs to be done in the offices so that we can uh, leave, leave the, the, uh, the, the operation as much out of the, uh, the line of fire as we can. Um, and then roughly, like uh, in terms of how we strategize the, the rollout, so we have multiple business areas, uh, sort of we do take a staggered approach. But the key takeaway here, I think, would be to say, when we are starting with a new business area, we try to do a small scale pilot. So go through the process from A to Z. So we, uh, we can basically get some, uh, uh, some, some uh, uh, buy-in from the, from the different sites, but we can also test 
how it would work for this particular business area. And we can uh, make adjustments. Then if that's uh, all green, we can uh, do the scale up where we involve more, more sites as we, uh, as we grow. And eventually you want to become uh, self-sufficient. So what we try to do is to make the business area uh, own the project in a sense. So they can perpetuate the, uh, the process. And at some point the group uh, 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 the blue part basically does, is no longer necessary because the business area can run it themselves basically. Um, so that's basically where we are now. So as you can see for some of the business areas we're already nearing that self-sufficiency stage. Uh, for other business areas we still have to start with that. So there's, uh, there's of course the lessons learned that we can carry over to these different things. Um, so where we are now, basically just like that, there's three things that we want to cover. We'll have to look at the time and uh, make sure that we uh, it's counting down, by the way. Uh, uh, that we have uh, uh, three three issues that we are like uh, uh, things that we're currently uh, doing in this process. One of them is uh, the self-sufficiency part. So how do we define when when is a business area ready to carry this the torch themselves? We'll have a couple of words on that. Um, the other one is uh, we are doing some of these deep, si deep dive sessions. So we have seen controls, uh, critical controls that may be problematic or have failed in the past, for example. We've now uh, found ways of you know, formalizing some of these deep dive sessions and, uh, and getting the experts together and getting some real cool innovations around that. And the third one is the dashboard. So we can actually show you some of the results and how it is displayed on the dashboard that we can see how the, the controls performing. So uh, very quickly, the first thing, okay, what does the self-sufficiency mean? Uh, don't worry about uh, most of the text on the slides. There's three, four main components that we ident identified. First of all, you need some kind of a capacity in the, in the business area to run the project. So you have to have a couple of resources that, uh, well, run the project in a sense. So schedule the meetings, decide which bow ties to create, uh, which people to involve. Then you'll have to have some kind of a capacity for people to do these uh, core bow tie to local bow tie translation workshops. So there's a, you have to have a couple of people trained up in that, have some competencies. Uh, then you would have to uh, make sure that the CCM data that you're getting is also embedded into the existing decision making processes. So it's all nice and well that you're gathering all this beautiful data, but if it's not tied into the existing decision making processes, then the data is probably not going to be used. So we want to, for example, identify, well, maybe this business area does a safety review every quarter. Well, then we want to make sure that the CCM data has a logical place within those existing reviews, for example, so that we have a logical place to tie the data into. And last but not least, uh, we want to be able to uh, give the, uh, the business area the resources to, uh, to form these innovation teams. So if a critical control is failing or has, is problematic, we want to be able to uh, group experts together, not maybe not necessarily only from one business area or one site, yeah. from multiple sites, and uh, come up with new ways to improve that control. So that you don't simply recognize that there is an issue with this, this control, but also have a vehicle to try to improve it. And that's uh, this is uh, one of the examples of the deep dive that we uh, have done. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, can you go back? Okay. We'll share the slides as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so as Jasper was saying, in one of the deep tie sessions, after we had done the bow tie session, one of the critical controls was the electrical safety rules. So anybody working with electricity has the golden rules that thou shalt do. Uh, when we brought everybody in, they said, well, um, we had six different individuals in the workshop. And some said, well, we've got seven. Some said, we've got six. And others said, well, there's only five electricity safety rules. So we realized at that point in time, we had all of these experts in the field in, in one room, and they're from different business areas all within the organization. And what's really interesting is that when we, re we had them, Jasper said, write down all the steps of your six, seven, or five electricity safety rules, and let's really see if any of them are the same. Those are the same. Those are the same. Those, those. And those are the same. Some people have one that says, thou shalt start the five electricity safety rules. And some of them say, did you do it? So there's extra steps involved, but there are five basic rules that are all within there. Yeah. So initially, there was a big conversation about how different we are. And then at the end, there's... Yeah. When you zoom into the control level, like the, the actual control that keeps people safe, this, it, it's more similar than... Like, it's, it's very similar. It's almost identical, I would say, across the, the board. 
So it's a nice way of, of uh, like uh, bringing people together and showing that there's more similarities than actually differences. And it's a sort of a, it's a silo buster moment. So it's an opportunity to bring in different parts of the organization to work together because everyone is solving the same problem. So one of the guys, as, as they were walking away at the, end of the, at the end of the session, they came to me and they said, Taylor, um, you know, what we learned, all of these experts learned is after working together for these two different sessions is that electricity behaves relatively similarly across safety management systems, <laughs> languages, and cultural differences. I said, amazing. So as Jasper <laughs> said, electricity, gravity, a lot of these things do yeah. work the same. So people get hurt the same way. So if we have the same barriers, we can stop those problems yeah. from happening. Yeah, and we did a lot more. So this was only the first step in the, in the workshop. We also digged into each of the prerequisites and then even overlaid incidents on it. So we could say, for example, which of the pre prerequisites have not been met in the past. So we can actually see from an incident point of view, this is an area where we have problems. And actually, by doing that exercise, we actually saw that in the incident at least that we reviewed, a lot of the times it already happens in the first two steps of the electrical safety rules, uh, uh, things already go wrong. Uh, so it was interesting to see that, uh, that heat map. Yeah, so this is uh, what the dashboard looks like. So you can thank Ruben for this uh, beautiful image. You have to turn around again. It's okay. <laughs> and I think like I, it is sort of self-explanatory. So you have the different hazards, the different controls, and how far these controls uh, have shown issues or uh, seem to be in control. Uh, there's all kinds of breakdowns that you can do. But I think the key takeaway here is to see that it's not only only the bow tie that you're looking at. Actually, like the vo we use the bow tie to identify what the critical controls are. But then when we're communicating, for example, to management layers, we're not showing the bow tie. We're just simply showing the results of these critical controls and how they are working. So sometimes the bow ties can be too detailed depending on who your audience is. And this is, can be a nice uh, uh, condensed view, which has been very well received. Um, next one. So some lessons learned. All right. So these are some things. As I said, um, even, even with the data pool coming in at, on a quarterly basis, we're already getting information from the organization that previously we did not have. So we don't know what the exact reasons are. That's not what the, the purpose of the program is. But we're finding out, for example, that um, interestingly enough, from the first data pool, we found out that on a wind turbine, the, um, the sliding, uh, sliding railing, so one of the barriers is a physical railing just keep you on the platform. Preventive barrier, preventive control. And they're they said that some of those railings are being left open. So that's a, literally a hole in the barrier. It couldn't be more literal than that. So the question came to us, so what do we do about that? And if we take that and we tie that into innovation teams, first of all, that information came nowhere else in the organization was that being reported. So now we have a, we have a report of it. And we have a dashboard of it. Thanks to Ruben. Sorry. And so now we, it's hatches as well. That's part of that barrier. Hatch covers to stop you from falling through and railings to stop you from falling off. So now you can take that problem to the innovation team and they say, well, what do we do? And they go, somebody a while ago invented a spring. Maybe we can spring load those hatches so that the, navel, the natural position for those is always closed. Uh, I know you can still put a screwdriver in and hold things up or open, but the idea is that if yeah. they aren't being closed automatically, you can do that. It's not always as simple as that, right? So sometimes the spring might be an answer, but it might also be not an answer given the location of that hatch. Sometimes it's completely impractical to do that. So that's why we, uh, we, we there's often no super simple answers to this. So that's why you want to have a team of experts to come up with real uh, solutions in that sense, rather than uh, what you do. Yeah, from my point of view, uh, Sometimes it's difficult because we have an agreement with also some companies, uh, for example, scenes where I deal with. Yeah. And they have a different mindset. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's really this, this for me, this thing is really, yeah. It's a big issue. It's a big issue. Yeah. yeah so, so I think what, what we try to do with the CCM is to, to be able to discuss these, because, because we have elevated this to be one of the critical controls we have the mandate to also talk about it on a larger level. So even like in the, when, when contracting maybe a new turbine, these kind of things should already be taken into consideration where we have the safety by design, for example. But also if you want to do changes, you know? It's very expensive. The, the MOC, MOC process, uh, where I come from, it was, it was common. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, what I see over now is it's, it's, it's not common in the company. Yeah. And you need to do it because you can have a new idea to, to, to create something with extra springs on it and things like that, but you need to, to do an MOC on it. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. So, so I think we try to see that as well. And 
what we tried to do with the dashboard is also to show that, okay, this control is currently red, for example, it's not working exactly the way we, we, we want to. And until we fix it, it will remain red. So at, at some point, people will start asking questions like, why are we not dealing with this? And then hopefully we get more traction and actually get this MOC process uh, significantly rolling as well. And then what, what's this? This is yeah, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll explain what it is and you can talk about what yeah, the actual sure. situation is. So this is a device which is a, uh, a self-rescue device where you would deploy if you're, if you're in a wind turbine or any, any working in height situation, you would deploy a line, you would snap into it, and then you would just repel down, and it, it's a one meter per second maximum speed, and it would let you down. What do we learn about that? Yeah, so of course people are fully trained in this, right? So if you go up into the turbine, you need to be able to, to do this. And uh, what, what we saw in the findings was like uh, people said, yeah, we have trained about th in this, in a sort of a training set setting where you can uh, do a small descent with this device and you can practice it. But we actually, I never actually practiced this out in the field where the, the distances of falling are significantly <coughs> longer. Uh, there is wind conditions, there might be spray, ocean spray, all kinds of situations, and we've n we never do this. So I personally don't feel very comfortable uh, with this idea so that when we actually have to use it, um, it's, it's restricted under Dutch law. Yeah, okay, so, so the... Like the fire department, if you want to, 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 to train on it, sometimes you need to go outside Holland yeah. to train it. Otherwise yeah. it's mm. not allowed. Exactly. And, but, but it is a critical control, right? So maybe the extra effort of doing that might be, uh, yeah, might be worthwhile in that sense. Uh, so interesting things. And the, I think uh, yeah, it's good to stress again, these kind of things we haven't seen in the occurrence reports coming up because, well, those things are luckily hardly ever being used in anger, right? So, so it's difficult to get occurrences on them. But if you go 150 meters down and the turbine is on fire, is it still according that you uh, use the rope? Yeah, yeah. It needs to be fixed with a steel cable in front of it. Ah, right, okay, so yeah, fair enough. Protect. So, so, th so those would be like uh, yeah, things to consider and also like uh, uh, to look for. But I think like the, the yeah, the, the main part is we're getting this information that previously we were not getting in a sense. So we're getting early warnings that these controls might not be as effective as we, we would like. To record the information as well. So even if there isn't something put in place, you can record that you have that discussion with the relevant personnel. Yeah, and you can evaluate whatever it also works. So you should be able to see in the statistics as well that these things would be better. And to Jasper's earlier point is the fact that it's, it has been noted as critical and everyone knows it is. So it, give, it, sort of, it sort of gives permission to open the door and say, we need to talk about this and yeah. what do we do? And these conversations about, can we train here in the Netherlands? Are there, are there legal restrictions, et cetera, to, that stop us from doing that type of training? No, so. it's, it's a validation. So you don't have any kind of liability possible anymore. Yeah. It has to be looked yeah. at. It's not like we didn't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here it is. Here it is. Yeah. They go, look behind yeah. this door, please. And, and it's also like uh, uh, the last point, like you can give people credit for doing things right as well. Like it's, you're not just measuring how often this control has failed. We're actually <coughs> measuring like how often are we actually doing the right thing as well. So we, we, we can, most of those bars are almost fully green. There's just maybe a few issues that we can uh, try to address. But most of the times we're doing this perfectly well, which is also something to celebrate and, and take credit for. And as a, I guess a final point, since we were out of time two and a half minutes ago, um, <laughs> is to say that what this program does is, so quite often we look at lagging indicators, and we realize that lagging indicators are a bit like driving a car by looking in the rear view mirror only. So what this does is this gives us the ability to measure, as you say, get credit for things that are going right in advance, and know that if the business says these things are critical and they're not performing well, then instead of saying that's where our last fatality was, we have the possibility of shifting that focus to a leading indicator to say this is where our next fatality might be. Let's put some corrective action in place and make it so that that's in place every time before they do the task. And that's really the goal of all of this in a summary. Yeah, but let's, let's be, there's a lot more detail. Like, I mean, we can go uh, on, uh, for ages. Also, the way we do it, we have structured these workshops and have a nice formula for them now. If you're interested in that, please let us know. Also, Ruben has the, the dashboard live as well, so if you want to click around in it, that's also possible.